Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today. This is Josh Pauly speaking here. We're going to get started here in a couple minutes, let people uh, join on. I see a number of folks getting on right now, but uh, we'll give everyone a few more minutes to uh, join, and then we'll get started. Thanks again for joining this morning. All righty. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining this morning. We're going to go ahead and get started, and uh, folks trickle in. That'll that'll work uh, just fine. So thanks again for your time this morning. We're going to uh, talk about uh, cobot welding and how automation um, can help uh, boost productivity in your weld shop for less cost and less risk than uh, ever before. So my name is Josh Pauly. I'm a founding partner of Vectus Automation, uh, and I lead up our business development and applications engineering activities. Um, so what we're going to talk about today for the next uh, hour or so, I'm going to show our product video to give you kind of an initial overview of the system and uh, some of its features. Talk a little bit about Vectus Automation, who we are, uh, where we're located, what we do, and why we do it. Um, go into the details of our Cobot welding tool product. Talk a little bit about what makes an application fit for automation and some of those initial guidelines uh, for success uh, for certain applications. And then we'll actually hear from uh, one of our customers in Colorado Springs, Andrew Lindloff at Conceal Tab. He's going to offer some of his perspective uh, on the system and also some advice for folks uh, looking to get into automation as well. Uh, and then lastly, we'll finish up with a live programming and weld demo here at the General Air Facility uh, in Zunai, uh, at the Zunai location in Denver. Uh, I just want to take a moment too and thank General Air for uh, collaborating with us on this seminar uh, and for joining us today. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, start off with our product video here uh, to give you an initial overview. So, and I'll talk about this quite a bit, but the, the reason that Vectus, we founded Vectus and uh, why we do what we do is because, um, as I'm probably preaching to the choir, there is a large shortage of skilled welders and AWS is not predicting that it's going to get any better. Um, and I think there's a lot being done in training and education and bringing more folks into the trade, which is great. Um, and I think that's one way to attack the the issue. And the other way too is is to to boost productivity through tools like automation um, and uh, better processes as well. And so that's what we really aim to do with uh, our system is to make it easier to automate, uh, lower cost, uh, and lower risk to automate as well. And so you'll see me, you know, when we do our actual uh, live demo, you'll see a, a good example of uh, the ease of programming. So you know, reduce the amount of setup time. Um, reduce the amount of time to fixture and program each individual part, thus enabling smaller batches and sub-assemblies and, and folks who, uh, where automation was out of reach before, uh, we're trying to bring it in reach uh, and make it as accessible as possible. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and skip the end of this video because we'll go through this actually on uh, the live demo as well. But I just wanted to show this to kind of give you an initial overview. And this is available on our website and our YouTube channel as well. So really quick about Vectus, um, our name actually comes from the Latin word for a lever or leverage, and that's really our goal is to provide manufacturers like yourselves uh, the leverage um, to, to boost productivity in your weld shop, um, again, for lower cost and lower risk and, and quicker to program. So we are a certified system integrator uh, of Universal Robots. So Universal Robots is uh, the pioneer of the idea of this collaborative robot. Um, they actually came up with the first, first 
co collaborative robot 15 years ago uh, and have since uh, sold over 40,000 worldwide um, in a variety of applications. And so uh, Vectus is a certified integrator of Universal Robots, and we are a team of engineers with um, 85 years of combined experience, soon to be 100 uh, over a century, um, with some additional folks we're bringing on on the team. Uh, but we've got 85 years of combined experience in the robotic welding industry. So that's really see, let us see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we've taken that experience and, and combined it with the new technology of the collaborative robot to, to, to make welding with cobots as easy as possible. We're based out of Loveland, Colorado, about an hour north of Denver. Um, and our entire focus is on um, this cobot welding tool product uh, to boost weld shop productivity. So some key uh, uh, value uh, pointers of uh, this product is its ease of use, portability, uh, flexibility and versatility, quick delivery, uh, and uh, cost effectiveness. And then we also pair that with peace of mind uh, through our return policy and our rent to own options. And as I just mentioned before, uh, the reason why we, we do this is there's that estimated shortage of 400,000 welders in the U.S. alone by 2025. Uh, that's from AWS. Uh, and our belief is that a collaborative man plus machine is going to help fill that gap. So going into uh, what is the Cobot welding tool, uh, it, it's what you see there on the right. It's a fully integrated um, mobile system uh, on a footprint of three feet by six feet. So it's portable. Uh, and that's really huge compared to traditional automation solutions that require anchoring um, and require large uh, footprints. Um, the way we see it and, and the way that we've heard from our customers as well is that, you know, this style of automation, this cobot automation does not really replace traditional robotic welding cells. It's, it's really seen as filling in the gap between manual welding and full traditional automation. So for smaller batches, for shops that don't have the space or the power um, or the, the programming skill. That's where it's really helping out on a lot of fronts. Um, and so again, it's portable, uh, so you don't have to anchor it to the floor. You can bring the cobot to the work, um, so you can butt up the cart right against an existing fixture or move the, the system around as your plant's workflow changes. Um, it's versatile, so you can fixture and weld on the, the, the rhino cart that you see there, that modular gridded table. Uh, or on an existing fixture as well. I'll show a picture of that in the next slide. Um, the reach of the Cobot's 51 inches and the torch adds about 17 inches beyond that. I'll show, I'll kind of talk about reachability a little bit later in the presentation and how that, how that works for welding automation. And then we also put a free drive button uh, on that torch bracket uh, to make hand teaching and leading, uh, lead through teaching uh, easy for folks who have never programmed robots before. And you'll see me use that in the live demo as well. And lastly, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a uh, small, compact, three foot by six foot footprint that's mobile. Uh, and for folks without three phase or, or high voltage 480, um, that is not required for the system. So the robot itself runs on a 120 volt wall outlet and the welder can run on anything between 208 and 575, including 240 single phase. So if you don't have single phase, that's, that's one barrier to entry that's now been uh, uh, removed uh, is that requirement to get the three phase. So um, three phase not required, but uh, could certainly run on that if that's what you have. And so I just want to show a few pictures uh, of the system and some of the applications that it tackled. This is a really good picture, kind of what I was mentioning uh, before on uh, uh, budding the system up to a an existing fixture. In this case, this was a large frame uh, and actually welding on that uh, existing fixture. Very uh, easy, quick to do. Um, we've seen customers butt two carts uh, next to each other to kind of double the workspace. Um, but at the same time, maintaining that uh, original system compact footprint of that three feet by six feet. Um, so you see some examples here, you know, thin gauge materials, uh, circles and compound paths, um, circles on uh, uh, pipe, slip on pipe flanges and various small parts, uh, and then also aluminum. So we've recently come out with an aluminum push pull package um, that's, that's been making some pretty beautiful welds, and we'll show some of those uh, uh, on uh, the live demo as well. A few more application pictures, kind of wanted to point out this one uh, on the thicker side. So uh, thicker is actually easier, I would say, for, for automated welding because you have more material to take the heat. So um, anywhere from thin to thick, I would say 16 gauge is typically the thinnest we go. It's, you know, thinner is sometimes possible, but you, we really got to take a close look at how consistent thinner can be. Uh, but 16 gauge all the way up to half inch, three quarter, multi-pass welds, um, all within the realm of possibilities. Um, you know, in terms of joint types, outside corners, circular, 
bevels, fillets, um, many of them are, are, are entirely possible. And then just a few more here, uh, example of some thinner materials, uh, some more aluminum examples. And then this is one of my uh, favorite applications, actually, um, a customer up in Fort Collins, um, SuperVac, um, doing their fan shrouds, uh, the tacking on those. I think there's 140 tacks per fan shroud and they make a ton of them. So you think, you know, when you, when you think of monotonous and boring and what does a manual human welder not want to do, that's, that comes to top of mind for me at least. And so they've been able to kind of offload that monotonous repetitive work um, to their cobot welding tool and leave the really skilled stuff to the skilled human welders um, that are already in short supply. So um, one of Vectus's core competencies and strengths and where we continue to invest time and talent and, and, and investment um, is on the software. And we really see that as a huge key to being able to make um, automation you know, more accessible to more manufacturers. Uh, so we've got a software development team in-house uh, and we continue to grow that. And so some of the things that we've done is we've been able to make this system uh, completely DIY. Um, so uh, all of our customers across the nation are typically set up and welding on their own within hours. I think one of my favorite examples of that is a uh, testimonial from one of our customers in Montana that said they were cutting shrink wrap in the morning uh, and welding production by the afternoon. Um, and so we've really tried to make it as easy as possible, both through just a simpler interface that we've developed, as well as our training tools like our instructional videos uh, and our user guide to make it as easy as possible for more folks to um, get going quicker. And so th that accomplishes a couple of other things too. You don't have to pay to fly out to us for training, especially in these, these COVID times. You don't have to pay to have our tech come on site to do the install and commissioning and training. Um, it can all be done uh, remotely and DIY, which a lot of our customers have really uh, appreciated and latched on to. Um, and so uh, the programming is meant to be very graphical. So there's no coding, you know, it reads very, you know, I get, I get a lot of questions of, you know, what's the programming language and it truly is, it's English or Spanish. Um, it reads uh, just like you might uh, expect it to. Hey, I'm gonna do an air move here. I'm gonna start my weld here. I'm gonna end my weld. Or I'm gonna do a circular weld. Um, it's simple commands like that to make that very easy. And I'll show that in our live demo as well. Uh, we put a lot of visual context on the pendant to where you're getting the information you need at the pendant rather than a thousand page manual um, so that you don't have to go dig through what's that page to understand how a circle segment is programmed or something like that. Uh, we have total uh, weld and weave control through the pendant so you can have travel speed, uh, voltage, wire feed speed, weaving, you know, either a zigzag weave or an inline whip or of course a, a stringer bead, no weave as well. But that's all controlled through the pendant uh, per weld. And the system also comes with uh, baseline weld templates for common weld sizes. You know, hey, I'm running 035 wire on carbon steel and I'm doing a quarter inch fillet in the horizontal. You know, I, I want to run it with pulse. We, we have some baseline parameter templates to make a, a pretty good weld right out of the box that you can then hone into your specific needs. And, you know, as having our software team in-house and, and having that as a core strength of ours, we're continually developing tools to speed up programming and, and enable more applications as well. So uh, the tack weld uh, that you saw in that video on the last slide, um, stitch welding uh, pattern that I'll show in our live demo today. So, hey, I, I've, I've got a row, an array of these um, same parts. You know, how do I speed up that programming? So we've got that uh, recently came out with touch sensing. Uh, we continue to come out. We've got some exciting things coming up uh, this fall uh, for uh, continual software development. So we'll continue to develop those. And a lot of that's based on customer feedback as well. So we, we, we keep a very tight, uh, uh, feedback loop with our customers of, hey, what do we need to improve? What would help you guys, um, you know, weld and program quicker? So we're able to make uh, uh, those improvements and changes based on customer feedback because of that in-house software development. Um, so, and then the last piece of that as well is, you know, making it affordable and accessible and providing that peace of mind. So it, it really is an affordable all-in system price that includes shipping. So, um, you know, we, we, we don't try and option out a number of things and, and land at a higher price at the end. It's, it's really meant to be that all in price that gets you going ready to weld. Uh, the system ships fully integrated and we do offer a unprecedented, uh, 30 day return policy. We've never had a system purchase returned. Um, but, uh, that's there as kind of a safety net for you. And part of the reason I think that we've never had a system returned and we'll get into this in the next section too is, we really try and help out on the upfront with the application evaluation because from our, you know, 85 years, almost a century of experience now, um, we've seen, you know, what applications go well 
and what applications go poorly and, and why that happens. So we're really able to consult and advise up front and say, hey, this will work or no, this won't work because of some inconsistencies or because of this well joint type or things like that. So we're able to kind of make sure that the application is a good fit before, you know, any triggers ever pulled or anything like that. Um, our lead time is typically about four weeks. We do have some expediting options available as well. We do have a, a pure financing program, and we also operate a limited fleet uh, of rental and rent-to-own uh, systems as well. So we've got a number of ways that we can kind of meet uh, your need there on, on the commercial side as well. I just wanted to share a few uh, customer testimonials. Um, you heard me mention that one from one of our customers up in Montana. We were cutting shrink wrap in the morning and in production by the afternoon. Um, some folks out in Greeley, Nofstinger Manufacturing, it started contributing the day it was delivered. It didn't make sense for us to invest in robotic welding until Vectus, they have changed the game. Um, another small mid-sized job shop that uh, wanted to remain anonymous in Colorado, but it's, it's singing sweet lullabies. It was cheaper, easier to use, and saves us uh, space relative to the traditional robotic welding alternatives that they had been looking at. Uh, and lastly, one of our customers uh, in Illinois that actually has a number of traditional robotic welding cells. Uh, again, one of those folks that uh, it's, it helps fill the gap between manual and, and full traditional cell, the Cobot did. Um, you know, they were running three sixteenths inch fillets at 33 inches a minute, and it only took um, that Cobot champion an hour to program uh, the production part, their first production part. So just a few examples there, and there's actually more on our website uh, as well in the product section. So the next, I want to kind of talk high level about, you know, what makes an application, application you know, a good fit for automation and, and ready for automation. Um, and, and before getting into that too, you know, talking about some of the benefits of automation done right. Uh, I think number one, as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's helping soften the blow of the skilled welder and the skilled programmer shortage. We hear that as well of, hey, I don't have, you know, the person that can understand or I've lost the person that can understand, um, you know, how to program my traditional robotic welding cells. So they need somewhat something that's a little bit easier to program and, and get into and, and retrain on if necessary. Um, improving quality and consistency, so reducing rework as well. Uh, improving safety and really reducing operator fatigue and monotony as well. Um, leveraging flexible automation for smaller batches, sub-assemblies, tacking operations. You know, you don't have to have a super high volume to potentially justify uh, a cobot welding tool like this. Um, lowering costs, of course, you know, and, and that comes in a few different uh, uh, ways. Obviously, one uh, is welding faster uh, and improving productivity in the weld shop. Uh, but we've also seen, you know, where we've got customers that are reducing or completely eliminating the post-weld operations. So grinding spatter or grinding out, you know, imperfect welds, that tends to go away as long as you've got good parts coming into the robot. Um, and reducing overwelding on manually welded parts. We hear that a lot as well. You know, you call out a 3 16 weld and, you know, um, welders are laying down a quarter inch. That's a uh, geometric increase in both weld wire used, gas, time. Um, so using the correct called out weld for parts is, is a huge benefit as well. Um, and we hear customers saying they get more business potential through increased capacity, um, reducing their lead times and reducing their cost. Um, and then, you know, cobots can help reduce the all-in cost of automating when you look at the full picture of system cost, delivery time, and, and programming and commissioning time, fixturing cost, the ability to redeploy, and then how much, you know, floor space is, is automation going to consume, right? Um, so those are the benefits, you know, when automation is done right. And here are some of the guidelines that we've seen in our experience to actually do that right. Number one being that consistency is king. Uh, number two is starting with the lower hanging fruit. And three is selecting the right champion. And I would say, you know, I, I get the question a lot of, you know, what do you see as the, you know, the biggest issues with folks, you know, getting their first piece of automation, getting that into production. And I would say a majority of it, you know, vast majority, probably in the 90% or so, um, fall into these three categories is one of these is not being met, right? So if these are followed, I really think they set up for great success with automation, whether that's a cobot welding tool or traditional automation as well. Um, so number one, consistency is king. And the key here is that repeatability is much more important than accuracy. And that's actually why the darts are off the bullseye, but in the same spot. Um, and with welding automation, there's really two, two facets of consistency that need to be considered. So one is dimensional and placement consistency. So I've taught the robot where this part is. I need to bring that part back to the same spot, right? And the fixture needs to be in the same spot. Um, so that's critical, number one. 
And number two is the consistency of the weld joint cross section. Um, and we particularly see this on, on um, uh, joints like outside corners, uh, bevels, things like that, where if, if one plate shifts, um, you get a drastically different, you know, weld volume to fill. Uh, and so weld automation, uh, you know, you, you set a certain voltage, travel speed, wire feed speed, et cetera, that's going to make a beautiful weld for a prescribed weld volume. Uh, and if that weld volume changes, you're not going to get that same level of weld quality. So there's two two facets to really look at: dimensional consistency and the cross section of the weld joint. And a lot of those can really be solved through upstream consistency, good fixturing, and sometimes part redesign. You know, slot and tab, um, and and other part redesigns can can make for better joints uh, to to make uh, the part more consistent. We've seen a lot of customers do that as well. And the reason why is that, you know, a cobot does not inherently know, and uh, automation in general does not inherently know if a part has moved or a weld joint has changed. There's no uh, human eye to make up for changes, right? And there are technologies, you heard me mention touch sensing earlier. Um, there are some other technologies out there um, that allow for inconsistencies to be managed. You know, we hear vision a lot. Um, our experience is that keep it simple. Um, you know, a lot of those work touch sensing vision, they have their applications where they work and they can help out and we can certainly advise on that. But the best way to manage those and the most simple way is to make better parts and make more consistent fixturing. And I think what's really nice too is that the, um, you know, with seeing how many lasers and CNC benders and things like that are out there now, it's really helped enable more weld automation because the upstream has improved so much and you know those those pieces of equipment have you know become more affordable to where more folks can have them. Um, and so we're seeing this become less and less of an issue as we see more of that equipment upstream helping out on this front. So some green lights here, no gaps or consistently small gaps. Um, laser or a CNC plasma table can be very helpful. CNC bent or consistently bent parts. And then pre-tacked is typically a plus if it's fixtured well when it's pre-tacked, but we've got plenty of customers that are doing non-pre-tacked parts as well. So it really varies by application and that's something that we can help with, consult with on, on individual applications as well. Some red flags typically are going to be manual cutting, uh, parts being shoved or hammered into place, um, you know, significant pre-wall grinding or manual joint prep that's, that's typically, typically going to result in a varying cross-section. Uh, and then lastly, open root or full pin welds. I've not been able to see anywhere in production where automation has really uh, succeeded uh, consistently with open root or full pin welds. Um, what I would say on that is I have seen where, you know, the root is done as a uh, manual first pass and then the uh, automation does the cap and fill passes and that can go well uh, if done right. Um, Number two is starting with the lower hanging fruit. So uh, one of my colleagues had this quote, if a person looks like a robot all day, it's probably ripe for automation. I think, again, a great example of that is that uh, customer running those fan shrouds um, in, in Northern Colorado. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's something that a manual welder doesn't want to do. And it's actually a great fit for automation so that that can free them up to work on some of the more skilled parts. Um, and I see this, you know, temptation to sometimes want to automate the, the most large or complex parts or, or the big assembly, because whenever it goes through the shop, it's a big labor drain. Um, and I get that. But what we've seen be the most effective deployment, or at least the first deployment or early deployment, is on the small, simple parts and sub assemblies, the monotonous uh, work. And so people ask, you know, well, you know, what, what, where do you look, right? What do you, what, what do you look for on a shop floor? And I, I try to look for the pallets of parts. Um, outside of manual weld stations, you know, that, that's, that's the stuff that's being done over and over um, and where that, that manual welder could be shifted to that large assembly in the middle of the floor um, to work on that, right? And so um, that's, that's a good place to look of where are those pallets of parts outside manual weld stations um, or, or where could those be, you know, how could you break up a larger assembly into potential sub-assemblies that might be a, uh, a nice bite to, to chew off with uh, um, automation. And so, you know, some green lights here is MIG welds on 16 gauge or thicker. Um, you know, I put this as yellow TIG applications that could potentially be done with MIG. I've got a few examples of that here. That's something that we, we really enjoy talking about with if you have TIG. We do not have a TIG package for our system, and there's a couple of technical reasons for that. Um, you know, one being the directionality of the automated TIG process. Um, but what we have seen is that sometimes current manual TIG processes uh, can be converted to automated MIG um, when you have the consistency and control provided by uh, the automation. And you talk about a uh, increase in productivity. I have seen 
on the order of 10 to 20 X going from manual TIG to Cobot MIG in the right application. It's, it's pretty insane. Um, so that's something if you're doing TIG and, and, you know, uh, MIG could be an option if it, if it, if it works out, we'd really love to talk with you about that and see if that, that might be an application that could, that could be, uh, converted. Um, steel, stainless, and aluminum, you know, we, we can do any of those three. We, we've got a push-pull solution for the aluminum now. Um, relatively open for torch access. Uh, planar welds that require no or minimal repositioning. There is no, you know, ability to manipulate a part uh, via an external positioner right now. Um, but what we have seen sometimes is that customers, you know, because of the smaller batches or because of their, you know, use case, it's not too hard to manually flip a part to, to another side to be able to weld uh, the other side or another uh, weld that needs to be done. So that could be an option as well. Um, and then a high arc time relative to the size and the number of welds is always going to be uh, a nice fit as well. And lastly, and this is this is huge, is selecting the right champion. Um, and when, you know, I, I get asked, well, what's the right champion? What, is it, what does he or she need to know? Um, I would say that eagerness and ownership are the two most important things for, for any Cobot champion. Um, really the technical knowledge I've seen can be learned. You know, we've, we've worked with folks that come from all backgrounds, owners, uh, owner, sons and daughters, engineers, shop foremen, uh, machine operators, welders, all sorts of different backgrounds, some with programming knowledge, some with welding, some with neither. Um, what we've seen kind of be the common denominator across all of the most effective ones is that they have the ownership to want to see the the piece of equipment uh, really succeed and they're and then they can learn based on that they can learn any of the technical knowledge that they need to um, So that's what I'd really recommend to, to look for there So lastly before um, uh, I hand it over to Andrew at Conceal Fab to kind of give his perspective as well I just kind of wanted to go through a few more slides here talking some of the technical uh, details So here's just a few examples of when we talk Cobot MIG versus manual TIG um, You know you, you look at some of these TIG welds that are you know gorgeous in their own right um, but you can also see that some level that you know that level of quality uh, and cosmetics can also be, be achieved on our system as well. So if you have some TIG applications that you're looking at automating, let's talk and see if they might be a candidate for MIG for sure. You know, a few examples here of some slam dunk uh, slam dunk applications that we that the, the system has tackled in the past. Um, reachability, you know, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. You know, 51 inches of the of the cobot, and this is how all robots in industry are are measured from the base axis to the wrist flange. And then our torch, our air-cooled torch, standard air-cooled torch uh, extends that beyond 17 inches. But when we talk about, well, you know, what can that reach? Is that a box of, you know, 68 inches? It's, it's not necessarily a box of 68 inches or a radius of 68 inches because it's, with weld automation, reachability is so very dependent on the weld angle and the part geometry. So you see these examples of pictures where, you know, the part geometry and, and how we're reaching those joints um, you know, it's, it's pretty easy for that to tackle and, and we actually gain the uh, extra reach of the torch as opposed to, you know, something like this where you might be doing um, some uh, tubing uh, where you're doing some vertical down welds or something like that. And you actually have to point uh, the uh, torch back towards the robot uh, and run like that. So you actually lose the torch reach. So reachability, it's, it's something that we like to look at on an application by application basis. Um, and so what, what I encourage you to do is, you know, reach out and let's talk about your specific applications, get some pictures or drawings or models, and we can happily take a look at those together and see if um, the system can reach or if, you know, there's some other creative ways to potentially reach as well. Um, one of the neat things about collaborative robots is that uh, they're able to do multi-zone and multi-part setups um, very flexibly. So uh, you see in this picture here, basically the cobots working uh, in this, what we term a zone on this side, while the operator can be loading and loading on the other side, right? Um, and because the, the safety of, of the Collabor robot is actually built into the arm, um, it allows for very flexible multi-zoning. So I can go back and forth, or I can have one here and here. Um, you can really set up the system to work in whatever way you'd like. You're not constrained to a um, perimeter uh, as defined uh, by maybe a, a cage or something like that. Um, and then last couple slides, just wanted to talk about the importance of gaps here. Um, so, you know, in these examples, you know, something like this, where we see uh, a, uh, a nice tight joint um, that's consistent from part to part and from corner to corner, um, that can go very well, right? You can get a result like you might see here. 
Um, when you have something like this where it's going to be a varying gap or a, you know, a gap that's larger than the material thickness, you can, you can start to see some issues there um, with blow through or underfill, depending on how that gap varies, right? Um, again, this is part of how we just like to help out um, identifying potential issues before, you know, any decisions ever made on automation is making sure it's going to be a good fit. And then, you know, this example here, you know, you can get a very nice weld, but especially on that thinner material on that miter joint, um, if that opens up the slightest bit, you might blow through as well, right? And so it's really making sure that those um, uh, gaps are contained and, uh, and as consistent as possible. Um, and here's a great example of the importance of consistent gaps, right? So this 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 is a, another Colorado customer up in Loveland that has a couple of our systems. Um, they uh, this is the gap that they were working with. So a pretty large gap. I mean, it's relatively thick material. I think it's three sixteenths or uh, maybe quarter inch material, but a pretty large gap by by typical standards. Um, but the what they had going for them it was incredibly consistent, laser cut, um, consistently bent, and we ended up with the same joint every time. And so like you saw in this video here, uh, actually able to do a little weave bead in there to, to, to manage that gap and make this absolutely gorgeous, uh, no grind required, you know, minimal spatter uh, weld. Um, and this customer has actually seen a uh, tripled uh, increase in productivity. I think they went from about 90 of these a day uh, to nearly 300 uh, with just a single cobot. Um, and so they got the second one in to, to help out with some other parts as well. So just an example of how consistent, if gaps are consistent, um, they can be uh, welded by automation, um, but that consistency is critical. Um, so with that, that's kind of the, the main section of the presentation. So before we get into the live demo, uh, we are gonna welcome uh, Andrew Lindloff of Conceal Fab in Colorado Springs uh, to go ahead and, and chat about his perspective and any advice you might have for um, you know, folks looking at automation. And I think I just unmuted you there, Andrew. Oh, Andrew, or you might be on mute. Andrew, can you check your phone? You might be on mute. I can't hear you at least. Let's see here. Sorry, guys. You'd think I'd have figured this out by now with how far we are into COVID, but uh, forgive me here. <laughs> well, so what we'll do, folks, is um, I'll see if I can work on that, but for now, um, we will just go ahead and get into the uh, uh, live demo right now, and then uh, we'll also try and see if we can get Andrew, um, uh, I can get the audio working for Andrew as well so we can hear his perspective. Um, so we'll go ahead and move into the live demo here. Uh, let me get that ready here. Okay, huh? so what we've got here for the live demo set up at the General Air facility in uh, Denver. Uh, on the left side of the screen is a live webcam view of uh, what's gonna be going on in the system. And then on the right side of the screen is uh, an emulation of what's going on on the pendant as well. So you guys can kind of see the, uh, the programming steps. Um, so what we've got here today uh, for our uh, presentation is we're gonna do these three stainless fillets here. Um, we're going to use 
one of Vectis' software features called the pattern feature to basically teach. I'm going to teach this first one here, the start and the end of that weld, and then tell it, hey, this is my, the start of my pattern, and this is the end of my pattern, and I've got three iterations. And so what that's going to do, the, the Vectis software is just going to copy and paste essentially that uh, whatever I want in that pattern uh, to the subsequent um, T plates as well. Uh, and so that just saves time on programming if you've got, you know, a fixture nest full of the same type of part, or if you've got a part with, you know, let's say six ribs on it or six gussets that you want to uh, are in the same spot, you can just easily program that. A lot of our customers do use that feature. And this is the, the weld that we're going to be doing here. Uh, this is 12 gauge material. We're using General Air's uh, Silver Shield 10 gas, that 1% hydrogen blend. Uh, we're going to be using a pulse waveform on the uh, Miller Envision welder uh, and just get this, this beautiful uh, fillet weld as you see there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and step up to the pendant here. Uh, this is what any programmer would see basically when you, you step up to the, you open the, or you turn on the, the, the robot. So I'm going to go ahead and hit new program. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and save this so I can call it up in the future. And I'm going to call this uh, general air uh, seminar right here. So we could run this in the future if we wanted to once it's saved. Um, and then basically on the left side of my screen here is the items that I can add to my program tree. Uh, the middle section of the screen is my program tree itself. Uh, and then uh, on the right side of the screen is kind of the detail uh, window pane as well. Um, so I'm first going to add a pattern. Oh, I think we got someone talking there. Is that Andrew? Andrew, I think I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. So we will put a pin in the live demo, and I would love to let uh, Andrew speak about his perspective and advice. <laughs> sorry about that again, guys. Uh, sorry for the technical issues. Okay, can you still hear me? Take it away, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to say thanks to uh, my sales guy, Joe McKinster, who's been uh, instrumental in, in our automation evaluation. Uh, thanks to Josh. We've worked with Josh this whole time to evaluate the system, um, to uh, to have the the rental system that we have now, and to to troubleshoot you know some of the things we've had come up. Um, when we were evaluating automation, um, we had a couple um, things that kept us from going to a, a more traditional automation system. Uh, floor space was one. Obviously, cost was another. Um, but we just had a, a high mix, low volume of parts, uh, and again, the floor space was another really big constraint. So um, we have a lot of small repetitive parts uh, that require fillet welds. Um, we have stainless steel and carbon steel parts, um, and we really have, like I said, a high mix and a low volume. So um, when we were looking at the system, um, most of our parts fit right on the table. Um, right now, uh, the parts that you see on the screen, we have circular welds, we have linear fillet welds, um, and primarily we're using the system uh, for stainless steel. Um, uh, one thing that we've really been focusing on is keeping our skilled welders working on the more complex work, uh, where there's more complicated fit up, there's more complicated welding, uh, positioners are being used, measurements need to be taken throughout the process, uh, and we really wanted to look at automating these small repetitive parts um, that welders frankly just get sick of after doing, you know, 50 or so, you know, they're, they're ready to do something else. So our, our focus has been um, trying to keep uh, our skilled welders, you know, on more uh, engaging work, on more complicated work uh, that we really can't automate at this time. So a little bit about our application. Uh, we're primarily welding stainless steel right now. Uh, we primarily weld 304 stainless steel. Um, we're using GMAW Pulse uh, with an 035 diameter Lincoln Electric Red Max. Uh, we're using 98 Argon 2 CO2. Seeing really good results with that. Uh, our material thicknesses are about 3 16 thick up to about 3 8 thick, uh, typically not making fillet welds over a quarter inch. Uh, we don't have any multi-pass fillet welds, and, and uh, kind of the sweet spot for us is a 3 16 fillet weld. Um, once, we, once we got the system, we realized that we were going to have to um, really step up our game on fit-up because we were just hand welding things previously. 
you know, we could, the operator could accommodate for inconsistent fit up. Um, so uh, what our team kind of looked like is uh, uh, a gentleman who programmed uh, a CNC machine and also designs jigs and fixtures, worked with a welder who had previous robotic experience. And those guys um, worked together and collaborated on how to fix your parts, uh, how to make things really repeatable. Um, we're actually designing custom fixturing that allows the part to go in the same spot every time. And it's almost impossible to put it in the wrong spot. Uh, so those two guys working together was really instrumental for us. Uh, we found that um, the gentleman who, uh, you know, was our CNC programmer, he, he didn't know a lot about welding, but that was okay. He, under, he was able to quickly understand the interface and work with the system. Um, and both those guys were able to get up to speed very quickly. Um, even if you had somebody who wasn't, uh, you know, had previous robotic experience, we found um, the system to be very user friendly. Uh, the day Josh brought the unit down, we were making production parts the same day. I think it was actually these parts right here. Um, the things that we've found crucial that Josh kind of touched on already, uh, we had to dedicate time and effort uh, to making it successful, uh, to working through, you know, learning a new system, to overcoming different challenges as they came up, but really focusing uh, and, and spending the time necessary to understand a new tool. Uh, our current application uh, parts similar to this right now, we have a person fitting while the cobot is welding and that person just fits and feeds, feeds the cobot. Uh, we've seen a dramatic um, decrease in part cleanup time uh, we're able to control our weld sizes much better. Uh, in some cases, we need to control the weld size because other parts fit up really close to the weld. You can see in the picture here on the screen, there's a hole that, that we can't get weld into. Looks like it's just right on the edge there, but we can control that a lot better with this system. Uh, the visual aesthetics have improved. Um, there's some people who don't necessarily care about how it took to get there. They just care about how it looks. And, uh, you know, we're able to improve the aesthetics. Um, and our quality is predictable. Uh, in this case, uh, we're able to run the same parameters every single day uh, and, and know what outcome we're going to get for these parts. Um, we have had some issues come up. Uh, Josh has been really responsive. Uh, we've kind of provide detailed info. We've worked back and forth. Uh, to kind of remedy some of the things that that just happen when um, when you are working with a, a new tool for the first time. Um, currently where we're at, um, we are currently finishing up our time studies. We're comparing hand welding to the cobot welding in the shop. Um, we, we've definitely seen some dramatic gains. Uh, right now we're putting the numbers together for ourselves uh, so that we know exactly what you know what we can expect. Um, and so far, we've been really pleased with the system. We're, we're getting excited to explore um, making the work surface bigger by butting up um, some more tables. Uh, and um, right now, we're mainly going to focus on stainless steel, but we have a couple uh, carbon steel applications that we're looking at as well. Awesome. Well, again, Joe, thanks so much for um, offering your perspective and, and your advice to folks looking at automation. and. Um, it's been great working with you and, and I uh, look forward to seeing what you continue to do with your with your tool. So thanks so much again for your time and, and your perspective, really. Sure. Thank you. All righty. Um, we will get back into the live demo here. Um, So uh, what we'll do here, so where I was at, um, I just, all I did was add the pattern tool from the node selection list on the left, which dropped in a pattern tool into my robot program. Um, and then basically the way the pattern tool works is anything underneath the pattern tool will be copied and pasted in the direction and at the spacing that I select through the number of iterations, right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and first add an air move, which an air move is basically moving to get ready to go to a part um, so that, uh, I can get ready to weld and avoid clamps and other things like that. And then I'm going to add a weld. Uh, and so when I click the weld button, it actually adds in a full template. And every template starts out with an approach, a start point, an end point, and a depart point. 
Um, so for an example like we're doing here on the T-plate, that's going to be the simplest thing to do, and that works right off the bat, just to start and end. But if I needed, I could add in a through point, and that through point can be linear to accomplish something like you see here, um, where we're just doing, you know, an angle and making a directional shift. Um, or I could also make those through points uh, circular segments as well to accomplish um, circles or other compound paths like you see here. So this example on this customer part is, you know, start here, a through linear, through circulars all the way around, and a through linear to finish. So that uh, gusset and pipe to the base is a single uh, weld, actually. Um, so you can string together uh, linears and through moves and circular moves uh, to make whatever weld joint uh, that you're working with there, essentially. But for this example, again, we're only doing a start and an end on this T-plate. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, just leave it as a start and an end and delete my weld throughs. So this right here is actually all of the uh, nodes that we'll need to weld these three welds on these three parts. So I'm first going to start with my air move. So I'm using uh, the free drive button that you saw me talk about. Uh, that free drive button, basically, when it's not pressed, the robot doesn't move. When it is pressed, I'm able to push and pull that robot to uh, where I'd like to program it, right? So just a really nice, simple, intuitive way uh, to program the system. So I'm going to set my air move up away from the part um, so that it can nicely move between these three. Uh, and I will go ahead and highlight the air move that you see that yellow node, which means it needs an input from me. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hit update waypoint, which teaches the current position of the robot as that air move, right? Um, and then the other thing, too, that you see here on the right side of the screen that I'm toggling back and forth, that's my welding live or welding blocked action. And so when it's welding live, if I ever hit play, it'll actually start the arc when it's commanded to. So whenever I'm programming, I just want to make sure I've got that blocked, right? Um, so that if I were to hit play, it would actually not go ahead and start an arc until I want it to, right? So I've got that blocked, so we're good to go. My next move, I'm going to bring it down here to the weld start point. Uh, again, I'm using the free drive button to bring that down to there. I could also use, I'll show it in a little bit, uh, handlebars to fine tune that as necessary. And I will do that. So I go to my move tab and I'm just going to go ahead and use my rotation uh, ability to bring my work angle to exactly where I want it at right about four, uh, 45 degrees here. Okay. And all I'm doing is just tapping these just a little bit to get that wire exactly in the joint where I want it at the start point, which is right there. So now I'm going to highlight my weld start node and I hit update waypoint, which is going to teach again the current. Uh, position of the robot uh, as my weld start point, okay? So that's good to go. The other thing that I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to teach what's called my pattern start point, right? And again, the pattern start point, all I'm doing on the pattern uh, with Vectus software is I teach a point on the first iteration and that same point on the last iteration in the pattern. And so to keep things simple, I'm just going to use the start of the weld as that pattern start point, right? So I'm going to hit adjust pattern start and OK, which teaches that as my pattern start point. And I'll teach that same point on my last uh, pattern once I get to that uh, stage. So next, I'm going to teach my weld endpoint. I'm going to go ahead and uh, use the adjust button, as you saw me do earlier, uh, to jog in a linear fashion to the end of this joint here. And just make sure it's right where I want it there. Perfect. Okay, so my weld end is taught now. And then the last thing I'm going to do, as I mentioned earlier, is teach my pattern endpoint. And my pattern endpoint, again, is just that same point uh, on the last iteration of the pattern, right? And so that's going to be pretty close there. Let's see, bring that in to the joint just a bit. Rock it up. Right there. It's pretty good. Okay, I like that right there. Um, so now I've got my full weld paths programmed. Um, so the last thing I'm going to do before we go ahead and dry run it and then weld it is I'm going to add in my weld process parameters. And so, like I mentioned, I can either pick from a library of templates. We load in some baseline uh, template parameters for, for uh, on every system. But then you can also modify those and add your own as well. So for this one, again, using the Silver Shield 10 gas with the 1% hydrogen, uh, we're actually going to run at 35 inches a minute travel speed. 
Um, we're going to use the pulse uh, waveform on the Miller Envision, uh, run a trim of 59 and a half, um, and a wire feed speed of 580 uh, inches per minute. For the for this example, we're actually not going to do a weave just because of the thinness of material, and that'll allow us to make this nice uh, stringer bead right there. Um, but if we wanted to, we could go ahead and add in a zigzag weave, as you saw on on some seal fabs parts in that video, or we could also do an inline weave as well, just with it back and forth. Or I think Bob calls it the Missouri shuffle, right? Uh, so there's a lot of options there for uh, whatever different type of weld uh, that you're looking for. Um, so uh, with that, I've got my uh, process selected as my 035 stainless 316 fillet pulse fast stringer. Um, so I'm good to go there. And my weld is blocked. Again, I'm toggling that icon back and forth. I've made sure my weld is blocked and I can check that in our status screen here as well. And so what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna dry run uh, the program to make sure it's in the joint, it's doing what I want it to. And then when we weld it, it's gonna look right. So all I do now is hit the play button going to go ahead and oh actually you know what i forgot to do one thing i got a little ahead of myself so when it patterns it's going to you know basically copy whatever it did here and move here and here so i need to make sure i have an air move or a depart point away from the end so i don't crash into the clamp right and so what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to teach my depart point to be over here so that it can nicely move away from the clamp over to the next uh, iteration so all i do here is hit uh weld depart and update waypoint, okay? So now we're good and it'll move uh, exactly as I want it to. So we see that moving there. And I didn't mention this, but we are using about a 10, 15 degree push angle uh, to get that stainless to wet out nicely. Uh, and that's right in the joint where I want it. So that looks good. We see that depart move there. Oh, caught myself with another moving too quick as well. So what it did there is it skipped over this one. Because I didn't, I forgot to tell it that, that there's actually three iterations in the pattern, right? So I, all I do to fix that is go back to my pattern tool node and tell it three iterations, right? So with that, this is why we do dry runs to make sure that uh, you weren't moving too quick and uh, that uh, everything's good to go. So back there in the joint looks good. Looks good there. Now correctly move to the next iteration. Looks pretty good. The wire's dragging a little bit, but that's all right. It'll be pretty good. We're looking pretty good. So the last thing we'll do now is uh, once it gets done, I'll purge gas, make sure we got gas coming through. Um, and then we'll go ahead and weld that. So um, I will save this as well. So again, saving it allows me to pull it up in the future again. If I was welding this part again, I would just pull up the General Air Seminar program and hit play to run these three again if this was an actual part or something like that. So lastly, again, gonna purge gas. We got gas, so we're good to go there. Um, and I'm just gonna clip the wire so we can get a nice uh, start as well. All right. So now to switch from dry run to actual weld, I just hit the weld live button. Again, we see that also on the status screen. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and say, everybody watch your eyes, uh, fire in the hole uh, and play, uh, play this weld through. Watch your eyes. Watch your eyes. That's all there is to it. I'll grab the camera here and zoom in on how these turned out. And again, if we wanted to do some circles, um, we could just simply teach you know different uh, circle parameters or things like that. Um, if you want to see how to do circles or other compound paths, I would definitely recommend checking out the Vectus YouTube channel. You can just Google Vectus Automation YouTube uh, and see some of our instructional videos there that go through circles and things like that. And just some other customer stories and application examples.
Um, so there are, you help me out here, am I looking good? There we go. So there are the welds there, kind of zooming in on them. Again, look pretty, pretty darn nice with that Silver Shield 10 gas. And then just a few other examples, you know, some carbon steel. Uh, this was that, uh, this was also run pretty quick, uh, pulse stringer at 33 inches a minute. Uh, some examples of our uh, recent aluminum welds. Uh, this one was turned out really nice. It's just a straight synergic pulse with some pretty strong penetration in there. Um, you saw some examples of, you know, thin over there, that 3 16 fillet on 16 gauge, all the way up to thicker bevels uh, and fillets and, and whatnot. So just a few examples there. Um, more examples and pictures on our website uh, and YouTube channel as well. And uh, as I've mentioned before, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us to talk about your application and say, hey, is this a good fit or not? Um, it's always our goal to make sure that we're giving you an honest answer on if it's going to be a good application or not. And so you'll you'll always get honesty from us. Uh, and if it's not a good application, we'll, we'll tell you why. And we'll tell you things can be improved or, um, you know, if traditional automation or Part automation is a solution. We'll we'll say that as well. So we're we're very solutions oriented, and we don't want to have uh, any of our systems not helping out. And so that's why we have that upfront applications process, uh, led by folks who have been in the field and seen the good, bad, and the ugly. So um, with that, uh, we'll open it up to Q and A here. If you chat, uh, type into the Q and A box. Um, we'll take any questions, uh, and if you have any that come up after this as well, please don't hesitate to reach out. I got a couple questions related here to uh, cost. Um, we will, uh, I can't say cost over the webinar, but uh, if you'd like to reach out to us at connect at vectorsautomation.com or my personal email, josh.pauly at vectorsautomation.com, we'd be happy to get you a proposal uh, and a quote. It is under 100 grand um, all in with shipping, though, I can say that. Any other questions through the question box? Saw two of those come through there. So the question, you were in the arms movement envelope. How do you keep OSHA happy? Um, let me actually go ahead and uh, demonstrate this. So uh, Jim, to your question, uh, the way that the, that uh, OSHA stays happy, one is we do a full RIA safety risk assessment. So the speed is throttled to a safe speed for welding applications. But really what enables this without a cage is the fact that this is a different type of robot called a collaborative robot or cobot. And why that is is because it's got uh, built-in sensors and, and uh, every ri or every uh, uh, excuse me every motor and also in the wrist that are monitoring both force and torque and speed and so um, if it hits an operator like I'll do it to myself right now it stops before any injury can occur and so I will go ahead here and demonstrate that um, it's not quite as awesome as a demo as the the guy that invented the uh, uh, the table saw stopper and he put his thumb in there but it's still you know I'm putting my life on the line here right <laughs> So I'll just go ahead and have this come out and, and punch me here. So, oh, that'll work. So it hits you and it just stops. And that's a pretty hard surface too right there. Uh, <laughs> and even if it was against your head, uh, it, it bonks it. You, you know it's there, but it doesn't, it doesn't cause any sort of injury or anything like that. And as you see, it is speed limited. So. You know, people might say, well, it's slower than a traditional robot. And that's true. Uh, and that's by design. The thing is, and I've said this before, too, if you're doing high volumes of a part, you know, that's what traditional automation is for, where it's moving fast and a third of a second of cycle time matters, right? Um, so speed, typically with our customers, what we hear, if it's a little bit slower, it's not critical, right? The other thing is that we've seen is that, you know, traditional robots, depending on where they're moving to and from, they never get to the full speed because of the acceleration or deceleration required. So it's really, really dependent. But you know, you're basically trading super fast speed uh, on traditional automation for flexibility, lower cost, uh, and ease of use with, with cobots. It's kind of the, the, the difference there. Um, so, 
water cooled torch option. Yes, we do. Yep. So we've got a water cooled torch option. Um, and we can also beef up the welder to the Envision 450. Um, how does it do a tool center point or is that required? Uh, that is required uh, and that's taught. We use a reference pointer here basically and for those uh, unfamiliar with the tool center point, the tool center point is basically how does the robot know where the weld wire is, right? It's what I'm programming with. Um, so we do teach a tool center point um, and there's actually, uh, David, there's actually a really good uh, video on our YouTube channel that goes through how that's programmed and why that's important as well. So what you see me doing here is rocking about uh, that TCP at the end of that weld wire. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, ability to program hot starts and crater fills for lunum. That's a yes. Um, we use the S74 MPA feeder that allows that. Have you used drum wire with the unit? Um, I imagine one of our customers have. We haven't seen it that often, uh, usually just with kind of the applications in the areas this is going into. The spool is a good fit, but there's no reason a drum can be used. I think it, you would need some, you know, smart conduit to get it up behind the wire feeder, but I think that would be entirely possible. Um, can you use the pendant with welding gloves on? Uh, no, you do need to take that off. It is a capacitive screen. You have the ability to tie in via internet uh, to diagnose issues. Um, not directly into the robot. Part of that is we know there are some customers that don't like uh, external communication on their equipment. Um, but uh, uh, what we can do, what we do quite a bit is FaceTime or go to meeting or Zoom um, where uh, the, um, uh, the end users just got their phone and video and we can kind of see everything that's going on. We've got some really strong remote troubleshooting abilities as well. Um, is there a Vectis service tech in Colorado? Um, yeah, so we're headquartered in Colorado, so we've got uh, service folks um, that uh, are available, and really the whole Vectis team is technical and capable as well. So um, we do have uh, service techs in Colorado, and how is the reliability of equipment and drives? Um, so the universal robot is uh, sealed gearboxes for life. Um, so there's actually very little maintenance on the system as a whole. As you can kind of see here, I mean, there's a, there's a kind of a closed system of the robot, um, the really bulletproof uh, welder and wire feeder, and then kind of the interface between those two. Um, so it's there's very little maintenance beyond visual inspection and, and of course the welding consumables. But the, the, the robot's sealed for life. There's no oil change or, or grease change or, or really any preventive maintenance kind of like that. It's mostly visual inspection. Um, what is the warranty? Uh, it's one year uh, for everything. Uh, and the welder is actually a three-year warranty uh, as well, welder and wire feeder. Do you have any schools using these for educational purposes, and do you offer an educational discount? Uh, yes, we do offer a discount, and um, we've quoted, I'd have to check with my team, we've quoted a number to schools. I don't know if one's actually been implemented. I imagine the person asking that question is with school, so you understand, or I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, the sometimes the cycle to get approval and the funding. So I think that's probably uh, why there. Um, have you tried using metal cord wire? Um, yes, yep, so we could run metal cord on, on this. I think I got through all of them there. I really appreciate all the questions, folks. Uh, are we married to Miller exclusively? Uh, no, it's our standard uh, and our default. We've been really happy with it, but uh, we can't. We do have Lincoln Walter options as well. And Andrew, to your final question there, I will reach out to you separately uh, about that, Mr. Hess. All right, any other questions? If not, uh, I'll let everybody get back to the day. Uh, again, thank you everybody for your time. Thank you General Air for hosting and uh, uh, collaborating with us on this. Thank you again, Andrew, for your perspective for these folks and, and your advice. Uh, and thanks again, everybody, for, for joining today. And please don't hesitate to reach out. All right, take care, everyone.